Hello, this is Annie de la Ver, Shaman of Avalon. In this video, I'm going to be explaining how the origins of the festival of Easter go back as far as the most ancient dragon law, which existed long before Christianity. Those dragon teachings in themselves make up a deep esoteric metaphor for the knowledge of how to bring the heavens down to the earth. Once I've explained how all that works, I will go on to tell you about how we use that knowledge here in Avalon to celebrate Easter, or Ostra as we call it, after the ancient goddess of spring. So, what do I mean by bringing the heavens down to the earth? Well, it's quite simple. In modern terms, we can compare it to installing inside us a new router with a high-speed internet connection to the gods. The shamanic knowledge of the technology for this is buried deep in the cognitive permaculture of all of us humans on the planet. We only don't recognise it because it has been concreted over by the dogmas of innumerable religions over more than a thousand years. But here in Avalon, some of us have been taking a sledgehammer to that concrete. So make sure you're sitting comfortably and um, I'll begin. And first of all, we need to go back in time. And so we pick up this story at the teachings of the ancient mysteries, which were practiced all around the Mediterranean thousands of years before Christianity. It's clear from studying their myths that the wise sages and mages of old knew how to bring down the heavens to the earth. This is because they were adepts in the mysteries of time and space. They had the knowledge of the sacred measurements that give life and movement to the cosmos and that find their alchemical expression in every living thing including us. Thus, they understood that the timings and locations of spiritual practices were key to their success. They knew that for the most auspicious outcome of any human endeavour, all thoughts, words and deeds associated with it needed to be properly aligned with the right stars at the right time and at the right place. The vital importance of this practice was inscribed on the ancient Egyptian emerald tablet, as above, so below. And so the pyramids and Vedic fire altars were built accordingly, as above, so below. The Vedic Indians described these cosmologically aligned ritual sites as yantras. The word yantra is just the Indian word for the technology on the land that optimises our connection with the hierarchy in the heavens above. In other words, the eternal gods who live in the higher arch that these storytellers ascribed to the Milky Way. So, how does this connection differ, you might be thinking, from praying anywhere and at any time? Well, of course, it's fine to do that too, and it does work. But it is the difference between, let's say, dial-up and high-speed broadband internet. This superior connection was, and still can be, achieved by constructing religious buildings as supernatural transformers of energies. So how did they do that? Well, that's what I'm going to be explaining to you next. It was by observing certain sacred geometrical principles in their architecture and in their music of praise. And that's why it's sometimes said by those in the know that the architecture of the great cathedrals, say like Notre Dame on the banks of the Seine in Paris, is like frozen music. But it also had to be sited on the right location and so this would be divined by a whole assortment 
of diviners like astrologers and astronomers and alchemists but also more importantly dowsers who would trace energetic lines across the land to find the right location and this is why dowsers are sometimes called diviners because they have to divine that knowledge usually with the use of a hazel stick these twisting serpentine electromagnetic lines became known as dragon lines or serpent lines. And so those with this knowledge would build their sacred temples, cathedrals, mosques, and synagogues, wherever these dragon lines crossed. And those crossings are called nodes. So let's say if you were to zoom out and do it all from the air, you'd see the layout of these buildings along the nodes of the serpent lines in a pattern or shape that was known in ancient India as a yantra. Sometimes whole cities are or were yantras. For instance, the temples of the Indian town of Varanasi, which used to be called Benares, were originally sited on this sacred layout. And that was what was led to the city becoming renowned worldwide as one of the holiest places on earth. This, of course, was in the days when a pilgrimage into a certain landscape was a real thing and meant something much more than just having a good long walk to think about things. Pilgrims, known as sadhus in India, to the town of Varanasi found that their prayers and offerings while within the sacred space there held much greater resonance than anywhere else. Unfortunately, though, the advent of Bhakti Yoga, or devotional yoga as it's sometimes called, in the 16th century wiped out this golden age of temple building. The trouble is, when love and not wisdom becomes the reserve currency of the consensus, people can get away with murder in its name should they choose to. As we see even in this modern age, when the feelies are put above the thinkies, all sorts of nonsense starts to break loose and cause havoc, even wars. And so it was then that the Mandirs of Varanasi began to sprout up all over the place, willy-nilly, as local worthies competed with one another to be considered the most holy and deserving of God's love by erecting the grandest and most gilded buildings wherever they felt like it. They made such a mess that now, five centuries later, there are only a handful of Indian holy men who have the knowledge of the sacred geometry of the original Varanasi Yantra. I must say though, I'm, as you probably know if you follow me, I'm fairly critical of the Christian religion for burying all this knowledge. Um, but you know, the Christian equivalent of back to yoga, which was based on the love for Jesus Christ, was that it actually wasn't so damaging to this knowledge as, as particularly Hinduism was. During the Norman period, um, they built their churches using the correct sacred ge geometrical principles of the mystery teachings and in alignment with the yantras of the lands. So how did they do this, I can hear you asking. Well, we're just going to come on to that. Let's just say they knew enough to know that they needed to site their churches as near as possible to the shrine that had, be, had already been powerfully operational on that dragon line for millennia before they arrived because of local shamanic knowledge. And this site was almost invariably around a yew tree. So if you've ever wondered why there's so often an ancient yew tree in churchyards, well, this is why. I mean, sometimes the original yew has passed on, but left her children, so to speak, and they carry on the tradition in this more or less the same spot. There is also a yantra where I live on the land we call Avalon, which I'm now going to go on to tell you about. Uh, because it is the landscape container or cauldron, if you like, for the magical celebration of Ostra. We call it the Diamond of Avalon. 
It was discovered quite recently, actually, by the visionary artist Yuri Leach, after he combined two landscape triangles that had been each found originally by two antiquarian researchers separately over the last few centuries. The dragon lines expand and contract in width according to the cycles of the moon. I talked about this in one of my recent videos, Moon Magic, and about how the serpent lines at their fullest width at full moon are probably the moon river that's sung about. They are to me anyway, they're just like a river. One of them goes through my house and it is like a huge energetic river washing through at the time of the full moon. But this effect of the cycles of the moon on the serpent lines meant that they were perceived by the sages and mages of old to be alive and wriggling their way across the landscape, like serpents sloughing off their skins, which they used as a symbol for rebirth. And there's a reason for that to do with the marriage of the sun and the moon that I'm going to come on to. But first you need to know, if you don't already, that there is a famous dragon line, known today as the St Michael line, that passes through the summit of Glastonbury Tor on its way up from Land's End in Cornwall and then it goes on to the east coast of Britain around Bury St Edmunds. We think the St Michael line was originally known as the Bell line after the sun god Bell but it, it is certain that it was named by Benedictine monks in the 7th century as the St Michael line and they built churches on the summits of the hills that it passes through and some of the ruins of those churches are still there today. We find in the sacred art of the churches and abbeys images of St Michael slaying the dragon. This is because the dragon, dragon slaying hero of ancient myths symbolises someone who has mastered the knowledge of how to bring the heavens down to the earth and thus how to build temples sited on yantras accordingly. This dragon-lined diamond of Avalon is drawn in the skies by the sun's passage on the four original pre-Christian festivals of the year. And these are known as Beltane, Lunasa, Imbolc and Sawain. At the same time, the other side of the diamond line is drawn by the passage of the moon from Cadbury Castle to Glastonbury Tor. These are the two highest summits from which it's f the moon's furthest southern and northern points can be seen. And so these two lines together create the diamond of the engagement ring of the sacred marriage on the land, which is known to alchemists as the alchemical marriage and which is known to esoterists as the marriage of the sun and the moon. And to people that do sacred geometry, it is the Vesica Pisces. But if there is a marriage, there has to be a honeymoon. And so what is the fruit of that heavenly coupling in the nuptial bed or nest? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure you've probably guessed by now, but this marriage leads to the ultimate symbol of fertility the hatching of the dragon's egg. All cold-blooded serpents, as I'm sure you know, and like as dragons are, lay eggs. Um, and this is why we give painted eggs at Easter, to give thanks for the rebirth of spring. I'm sure you've seen the jeweler Gustave Fabergé's beautifully elaborate jeweled eggs which I think must have been created in acknowledgement of these dragon mysteries. In the 19th century, when Fabergé was training in his craft with goldsmiths, the study of metallurgy was closely aligned with the study of alchemy and apprentices were sworn into secret guilds. A lot of the wisdom of the mysteries was passed on in that way to them. Easter takes place on the first full moon after the spring equinox, which as I'm recording this talk in March, sorry, no, we're in April already, in April 2022, it will be on Saturday the 16th of April, 
so it's about a week away from now. Because Easter is always celebrated on the first full moon after the spring equinox on March 21st, then that's why it's never fixed to a set date on the church calendar, unlike Christmas is. The Christian church celebrates Easter Day on the first Sunday after that first full moon, also known sometimes as the pink moon. The cross on our hot cross buns also comes from this old esoteric practice. And there's some really amusing stories connected with this. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard, King James I tried to ban hot cross buns in the 16th century because he said they had supernatural qualities. He actually knew quite a lot about earth magic and he didn't want ordinary folk like you and me practicing it. But it's not that the buns themselves are supernatural, I promise you they're quite safe to eat. It's all in how they are used in magical rituals. Even over the last few years, a number of pressure groups have suggested that hot cross buns should be banned so as not to offend Muslims. But these bans, buns are not Christian. King James I could have told them all that. Small buns or cakes were traditionally always given out on all four major pre-Christian festivals, as I described before, Beltane, Lunasa, Sawain and Imbolc. The astrological symbol for the earth is a circle with a cross, just like a hot cross bun. The cross represents the cross of the four major festivals of the year, and at the same time, the cross of the nodes, in other words, the power points of the land where the dragon lines intersect to form the yantras. You've probably heard the tale about King Alfred the Great burning the cakes. And it's always told as if he made a mistake and somebody asked him to keep an eye on some cakes and he forgot and let them burn. Well, that's not really what that story is about. And it brings me to another location near here on the St. Michael line. It's a high grassy mound called Burrow Mump. And it is a major landmark on the outline of the Diamond Yantra. Alfred has retreated to the wilds of the Somerset marshes to lick his wounds from his many defeats at the hands of the Vikings. He was staying at Athelney Mon Monastery which is about a mile from Borough Mump, as the crow flies. But the story of King Alfred burning the cakes is an occult magical reference to this ancient traditional practice of burning a cross on the Easter buns to offer as thanks to the goddess of the spring. You just take an ordinary bun and with a hot brand or knife, burn a cross on it. It's as simple as that. Anyone can do it. Even today at Easter time, some of us still stand on the grassy banks of Moon Drove and we throw our hot cross buns into the river that runs below Burrow Mump. This is an offering of thanks that we give to the goddess of the spring, Easter. If you'd like to know more about the magical druidic knowledge of the Wessex court of King Alfred the Great, which helped him to win the seminal battle against the Vikings at Eddington in 878. It's all in my book, Stories in the Summerlands. But also, you might be considering a pilgrimage to this re region of Somerset, and I highly recommend that you do. In which case, Stories in the Summerlands would be the ideal guide to help you find all the secret es esoteric places on the landscape through the magical veil of the Holy Land of Avalon. You've been listening to me, Annie de la Vaux. All my books are on Amazon, and if you'd like to support my work, I'm on Patreon as Shaman of Avalon. <laughs>